This ball is a solid. It's made of many tiny atoms, but those atoms are locked in place with respect to each other. This water is not like that. All the water molecules are sloshing around and sliding past each other like balls in a ball pit. We can say something similar about the atmosphere. All the molecules in the air are whizzing around, sometimes bumping into each other, but usually just flying solo. Liquids, like water, and gases, like air, are called fluids. A fluid is a substance with no fixed shape because the particles are moving around, and they can be kind of tricky to study. It is very easy to predict what solids will do. If we throw a ball, or fire a cannonball, or drop something off the roof, there are very simple equations that predict exactly what these objects will do. If we have enough information, we can predict with great precision how high they will go, how long they'll be in the air, and exactly where they will land, just like we learned in my classical physics series. But the behavior of a fluid is not so easy to predict. There's no simple equation we can use. Because a fluid is not one thing. Fluids consist of trillions upon quadrillions upon quintillions of molecules, each doing its own thing. That's why for hundreds of years, we've been able to predict the behavior of even distant objects in space, like planets and comets, and say where they will be at any given time, while it is still so hard to make predictions about the weather here on Earth. Planets and comets are solids, so we can use those equations we mentioned and do some math. But with the weather, no such luck. Nevertheless, we do still study fluids. That's the focus of a field called fluid dynamics. And today we're here at UCLA to talk to geophysicist John Arno, who studies fluids every day. Let's pop in for a chat. Dr. Arno, thanks so much for meeting with me. Uh, tell me about what got you interested in studying fluid dynamics. So I was studying physics, and then I became interested in geophysics and took uh, an upper level geophysics class, global geophysics, and I fell in love with planets and understanding the global behavior of planets. And actually then I went to grad school for that. And it wasn't until about my third year of grad school when suddenly I had this epiphany that, wait, okay, I'm studying planets, but I'm becoming a fluid dynamicist at the same time. And I kind of got lucky in that it ends up I love fluid dynamics. Because but I didn't really know right. when I went in. I thought I was studying these planetary bodies. Yeah. But what's happening there, it's all fluids. So you were in my, in my in space, yeah. But then, of course, all of these planets yeah. are, many of them are largely fluid in composition. They, and they the, have various fluid behaviors mm -hmm. on various time scales, mm -hmm. right? The mantle of Earth is convecting right. on a 500 million year time scale. Mm -hmm. The core is convecting on, let's say, in a thousand year time scale. Mm -hmm. Those are both fluid dynamical responses. So given the broad scope of your interests, what are some of the focuses of your lab? So we work on hydrodynamics in the outer parts of gas planets, so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, how do they get their big jet flows in mm -hmm. their atmospheres? And how do they get the big vortical structures that we observe that are so beautiful? Um, in addition, we spend a great effort trying to understand how planets generate their magnetic fields. And that focus, a lot of it is actually on Earth. Mm -hmm. and Earth has this amazing, coherent, global-scale magnetic field. And it's generated within the inner half of the planet, which is all essentially a huge iron ball about the size of Mars. Mm -hmm. And the outermost part of it is liquid metal. It's molten. And as the planet cools off, this fluid is moving around like fluid on a pot on a stove, but it's a rapidly rotating pot. Mm -hmm. And that gives the magnetic field some interesting characteristics that we observe. Before we get too far, let's cover some basics. We talked all about the formation and composition of the Earth in my astronomy series. But if you didn't catch that one, let's go over a quick thing or two. Gravity pulls everything on Earth towards Earth's center of mass. And the greater the density of a substance, the harder gravity pulls on it. That's why the air is up there, the water is down here, the rock is under that, and all the way at the center is tons of very dense iron. The Earth has an iron core. The inner core is crushed into a solid by gravity, but the outer core gets crushed a little less, so it remains a liquid due to the unimaginable heat. And like we said, liquids are fluids, so all that molten iron in the outer core is able to flow. Given that it's hotter going towards the center and cooler going away, convection currents exist in the outer core. 
This is where the hotter iron at the bottom of this layer starts to rise. And as it rises, it cools. So it falls back down, where it heats up again and rises. And this cycle repeats, just like what happens with water and air up here where we live. As it happens, the motion of this molten iron generates an enormous magnetic field. This is not quite like a bar magnet, which is solid, but rather operates by something called a dynamo effect, whereby mechanical energy is converted into electrical energy. As molten iron moves through this magnetic field, an electric current is generated, and the resulting electric field will in turn create a more powerful magnetic field. The full story is much more complicated, but that's the gist. And it is the case that we need constantly flowing molten iron for this to work. But one question becomes apparent. Why is the Earth's magnetic field aligned with its rotational axis? We know that the field lines emanate from the poles, which is why high energy charged particles from the sun get deflected out to the poles, where they collide with atmospheric particles and generate the aurora borealis. But why do the magnetic field lines point this way and not some other way? Perhaps Dr. Arno can help us understand. Okay, so what are we going to do here? What we're gonna do is do a very simplified set of experiments to understand how convection in a rapidly rotating system works. Earth's core is convecting, mm -hmm. and it's rotating really fast. The rotational forces, the Coriolis forces, are huge. Mm -hmm. So we wanna understand how does that change the system? And what we'll do is we'll do a comparison between two cases. One where we're doing an incredibly slowly rotating planet. That's our tank here on the left. Mm -hmm. So slowly that it's actually not rotating at all. Right, we can essentially, uh, it's negligible. Yeah, basically. it's yeah. the end member case. Yeah. And then we'll do the other case where it's rotating actually pretty fast. This is a record player mm -hmm. and it's going at 33 RPM. Standard scientific equipment. You got it, you got it. <laughs> yeah. And so let's compare what happens. And in doing that comparison, hopefully we'll see how they differ and how they're similar as well. Right, let's do it. Should we do it? Okay, so Dave, you're gonna take this creamer little packet mm -hmm. and I put a little yellow food coloring in there so we, so we could see it. see it really well. And you're just gonna pour it right down the axis right of this the tank. Okay. Yep. Beautiful. So the creamer is cold, which makes it dense, and it's also got other materials in it, so it's chemically dense as well. And it simply falls through the layer, dense stuff sinks, falls, spreads out, and then eventually will fall again, and in time will coat the whole bottom of the tank. Now we're gonna do the same exact experiment, almost the exact same fluid layer, same tank, We've just added rapid rotation, which is right. what matters so much in all these geophysical yeah. problems. Okay, so we're gonna take it, we're gonna do, um, do the exact same pour, I hope, as you did. And you can see the fluid still sinks. It falls through, but it doesn't really sink down and coat the bottom. Instead, it gets wrapped around. And so it becomes a really big, oh, it's beautiful, a big cotton candy it set looked, of columns. It does look exactly like cotton candy. Yes, I had no idea it would yeah. be that cotton candy-esque. And you can see all these structures, but they're all well aligned with the rotation axis. Mm -hmm. Think of how long it took all the yellow fluid, same fluid, same density, to sink down in the non-rotating case. Here it's not happening. And it's, again, because it's a gyroscope. The fluid tries to spread out, and instead Coriolis swirls everything around into a column and it gets yeah. stuck at that scale. E even the smallest substructure is still very spire-like yes. and vertical. Yeah. What does the plume experiment tell us about Earth's magnetic field? So when we did that experiment, we first did a non-rotating version of it. And that's more like what you'd see if you just dumped some milk into a pot in your sink. It would simply fall and settle due to density. And, yeah, yeah, the dense stuff would fall and spread out. Standard. Yeah. Kind of normal, it's kind of what we know. But when it's rapidly rotating, instead the whole fluid volume acts almost like a gyroscope and, in, and it kind of keeps the fluid motions acting gyroscopically as well. And they wrap up and align with the rotation of the system. The whole system's a big fluid gyroscope. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then if you perturb it with this denser fluid, 
that acts gyroscopic as well. Well, that's what's happening inside Earth's core as, as well. Mm -hmm. At some significant level, the fluid motions are all aligned with the rotation axis. Those motions are taking magnetic field that's there and regenerating it. Mm -hmm. But it's always regenerating it with a background alignment. So right. the magnetic field, on average, tends to roughly be aligned with the rotation axis of the Earth. So if we're talking about the way the rotation of the Earth affects fluids within Earth's core, then certainly there's got to be a correlation with the fluids on the surface of the Earth. So uh, what can you tell us about uh, weather patterns and, and, and things like that? Okay, so, so the great thing is when you go and look at weather patterns, you see these often these big structures. They're fairly well organized. And if you look, they tend to drift, usually, let's say, from west to east, where we live, right? Mm -hmm. That is another effect of this rapid rotation. These are called Rossby waves, basically. Mm -hmm. And we have the same thing in Earth's core. But they're magneto Rossby waves. So a lot of the basic drifting patterns that you'd expect to see in the atmosphere, we think something like that is existing in Earth's core as well. And mm -hmm. a lot of the theory for dynamics in Earth's core Actually, it kind of follows from what the atmospheric and ocean dynamicists have done 50 years ago, but n now we harvest the basic ideas and we add some further complexity in that there's all this magnetic right. physics to deal right. with as well. Mm -hmm. So the basic fundamental dynamics is the same. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll do an experiment on one of our larger tanks where we can generate some atmospheric-like vortices and you'll say, hey, those are the same ingredients as essentially as the experiments we did to look at core style flows. Mm -hmm. The ingredients are the same. So Taylor, you're an undergrad in Dr. Arno's lab. Tell me about what you do day to day. Uh, so day to day, I'm kind of in here working on this device um, that includes sort of like, you know, doing actual trial runs for the experiment. Our goal here is to um, sort of simulate uh, how the outer core is moving around at low latitudes. Mm -hmm. By low latitudes, you mean towards the equator? Yeah, or, close okay. to the equator. So close mm -hmm. to the equator. Um, and basically, we use the fact that water will be like pushed out because of the centrifugal force mm -hmm. as a way of simulating like its fake gravity, basically. Mm -hmm. So you so you built this guy? Yes. And you're filling this with water? Yes. And it's what, water. what's going on in the center? So we have hot water on the outside, okay. and we'll put lots of ice cold water on the inside, and basically because there's now a difference in temperature, mm -hmm. um, the dense stuff, the dense water from the middle starts getting pushed out. We demoed with the thermographic camera that we're using, and you see so sharply the same types of structures that you see in the numeric model. Mm -hmm. Like, they line up almost perfectly one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. It's actually gorgeous. It's cool to think that in, in someone like Dr. Arnaud's lab, there are so many different ways that you could be doing science. Oh, yeah, exactly. You could exactly. be building things, you could be running experiments, you can be analyzing data, and there are different roles that sort of cater to whatever someone is most interested no, in. No, exactly. Yeah. So, Joel, you're a graduate student in Dr. Arnaud's lab, and you use uh, this apparatus. Uh, can, mm -hmm. do, can you tell me a bit about what this is? Uh, so this is a uh, rotating convection device mm -hmm. um, I've spent the last year building. So you, so you um, built this? Yes, this I is, built That's it. incredible. Um, how did you do that? <laughs> uh, well, so when I got here, this, this whole table was already here. Mm -hmm. um, it rotates. Um, and I built everything that's above this surface. Okay. So starting with um, our little convection cell. So Convection means that we heat the bottom and we cool the top mm -hmm. uh, to drive this convection where cold stuff sinks and hot stuff rises. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have uh, what are called thermistors and they are temperature sensors mm -hmm. inside the blocks so that we can measure the exact temperatures across the layer. And making sure that the convection is happening. And yeah, making okay. sure that it's happening um, and also I mean, the whole point is to kind of study what happens to the fluid under different conditions. Um, those conditions being thermal conditions, so different temperatures. Um, how, how much of the differential there is temperature-wise? Yes. Okay. Or uh, maybe how fast it's spinning? How fast it's spinning. Okay. In between classes, I uh, will just tinker with the setup and try to get it perfectly the, the flow fields. And then usually by the time I can make it back in here, things are ready to start running, okay. um, start collecting data, start taking movies. 
So you found your graduate student here in this lab as well, and you, you focus uh, mainly on this device? Yes. So, tell us about this. So this is called Romac, uh, which means uh, it has rotation and also magnet. Mm -hmm. So unlike the other devices in our lab, uh, this one actually has a, a capability of applying a vertical uniform mag uh, mag magnetic field. That, that's this thing Yeah, here. that's this okay. thing. And also, we can rotate the whole device um, at the middle leaf. Okay. Right. So you get this spinning, mm -hmm. and then this whole thing comes down, and it applies a magnetic field. Exactly. So external uh, magnetic field. Right. And uh, we are trying to understand like the basic dynamics of mm -hmm. what's going on, uh, especially interactions with liquid metal, because uh, on this device we can we have we right. have the ability to use liquid metal, uh, which is very similar to the uh, the fluid in the outer core. Right now, the study we're, that we're doing on this device is with the liquid gallium, which is a liquid metal can melt uh, in the room temperature. And what's cool about it is rotation, if you add rotation and magnetic field together, mm -hmm. they are not compatible to each other. And they actually create more complex dynamics. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, it's not just simply adding them together, uh, but they actually create something else that we are very interesting to see what, uh, what that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, very interesting to plot it out uh, what's, uh, what's the regimes of different behaviors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is what this device is built for. So earlier you mentioned uh, becoming interested in the fluid dynamics of other planets, uh, other worlds in our solar system. So how do the models that we've been talking about apply to, to those systems? So for instance, um, we were studying turbulence in a rapidly rotating system and we bought the biggest uh, effectively trash can we could. It was a big <laughs> industrial polyethylene cylinder, you know, just cylindrical can, and we spun it with about 500 liters of water at about 75 RPM. We couldn't do this in my lab. I did this with my colleagues in Marseille. And out popped Jovian-style jets. So these are the, the, the layers of gas, sort of the bands of gas that yep, we see on the we surface of the planet. Yeah, and those banded, it's interesting. Because they sort know, of run at, at varying velocities, sort of. So on, on Jupiter, you have these back and forth jets. Mm -hmm. They vary with latitude in their direction. And it looks like they're all existing in the cloud layer, but there's now recent data from the NASA Juno mission that's been interpreted such that the jets go down a couple thousand kilometers interior deep into below. the interior. Okay. So now it's these big interior, really very large structures. Mm -hmm. And we showed you can have those in the lab. Mm -hmm. So and are you getting clues about what is responsible mechanistically? Great question. So what we did first was show you even could make a jet like that exist exactly. in the lab. Right. What's still an open question that I love is what drives them. Because mm -hmm. on Jupiter, what makes Jupiter really amazing? One of the interesting things about Jupiter is it receives about the same amount of energy from the sun as it emits from its interior. It is a big beast, right? right? So you don't wake up in the morning and talk about the weather very below often below you. your feet, <laughs> yeah. right? It's right. just not it's all that from often. Above. Yeah. Typically, it's coming from above. Well, on Jupiter, it's one to one. It's radiating from the core. Uh, just from its entire deep interior, it's slowly cooling. Okay. And as the whole planet's cooling, it's letting off a lot of heat. Right. So, then the question is, what drives those jets? Exactly. Is it the sun from above? Or is it the heat coming out from below? That already slightly clarifies it because I hadn't thought of this aspect of dual forces oh, in yeah. opposing directions. That oh, seems yeah. very clear that that could generate some discrepancy in the rate of flow. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a mess. <laughs> and I love that mess. Mm -hmm. You know, like this is a question. Yeah. People have been arguing about that one for well over 50 years. Mm -hmm. You have the, this is the most, these are the largest scale fluid dynamical structures in the solar system. Right. What drives them? Yeah. We can't answer that. Well, that's and, a good one. And to model right. it with a garbage can, uh, you know, I love that. I think the most fascinating aspect is that we can do studies that are relatively simple in their setup that yes. can shed light on su such an incredible astronomical phenomenon. And right. Easily, yeah. Right. What do you have in your midst right now that has sort of got you the most excited? Maybe my most favorite experiment at this moment is Taylor's experiment. So what I want to get in that experiment is to see if we can make kind of a great red spotish type flow, big vortices, which I think exists in Earth's core, but nobody's really seen that ever in mm -hmm. their simulations ever. Mm -hmm. And yet we often talk about there being big gyres that probably explain some of the structures in Earth's magnetic field. I'd like to get that in the lab. 
Mm -hmm. right? If that exists, can mm -hmm. it exist in the lab? And if it yeah. can't, maybe our explanation's wrong. I don't know. I just know we've never even tried to do that in my mm -hmm. lab. Right. So I'm super excited to go after new physics. Demonstrate something physically, say, see, that happened. Or show it can't happen. Or show, yeah, Some people have argued can. they don't exist. They'll get sheared out by jets in the core. Okay. Okay, well, is that true or not? I don't actually we have know. have to check it out. <laughs> right, and yeah. I want to I go there. Mm -hmm. So her experiments really knew that way. Mm -hmm. And I love really new. <laughs> yeah, that like, sounds good to it's me. It's fun, yeah, yeah. it's going to be super fun. <laughs> cool. So that's a little introduction to the field of fluid dynamics and what it's like to study it. If you're currently a student and you're intrigued by what you just saw, make sure to do well in your physics classes. And one day you could do work just like Dr. Arno and his team. The more people we have working on these issues, the more likely it becomes that we can answer big questions regarding the weather and other natural phenomena, whether here on Earth or even on other planets. That's it for today's episode of Get to Know a UCLA Scientist. I'll see you next time. Thank you.